Okay, I'm sure you've got lots of questions, and if we could follow the usual protocol, because this discussion is being recorded, so wait till the microphone arrives, and then if you could say who you are, where you're from, and then pose your question, please, sir. Thank you. Margaret Coots. Uh, I'm currently chair of the JISC content, uh, advisory content group. Yes, that t that's the title. Um, I'd like to pick up on that point about government. I think you've sort of answered this question, but I'd like to be clear about it. We've, we've recognised that in Britain there is a, a recognition at government level that there is a value in open access to publicly owned data. And that, I think it's fair to say, sits within a wider context of a political... Uh, imperative about digital Britain and Britain being well up in world class in its, its, its digital environment, which means that as you start to think about library type projects like yours, if you're in that environment, it's quite a sympathetic environment. It's not going to get you everywhere, but it's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. What's the parallel in the States? What, what is the problem? What, what is it like in the US? What, yeah. What's the relationship for you with government? Will they jump up and down with enthusiasm to hear your ideas or, or what? <clears throat> I don't have a good answer to your question. It's a very good question. Um, as, as you gathered from my brief narrative of how the DPLA developed, it's completely a private affair. It, it was a pet project of some of us at Harvard. Now it's, it's expanded much beyond that. Uh, we're talking with public libraries, which receive municipal funds, etc. But the role of the federal government has been zero so far. Now, what we... Well, I should amend that slightly. When we announced last October the general plan for the DPLA, our meeting, which was a large meeting and attracted a good deal of attention, was uh, hosted by the Library of Congress, the uh, National Archives, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we do have several national institutions funded by the federal government that get it, that really are committed to this, and understand that it's something that will deliver value to ordinary citizens. So it's not just a scheme dreamt up by a bunch of high-minded college professors. In that sense, you could say that Washington is behind it. But the, the federal government and Congress, they, they haven't even been approached. My hope is that we'll get it up and running from April 2013, and then it will acquire momentum. In fact, uh, congressmen will find that their constituents are using this and that some community college in, uh, in one of their s states is actually enriched by access to this sort of information. And so there will be support building up from within the constituencies of congressmen and senators, and that we will, in the long run, get congressional backing. But in the short run, no. And so um, I can't say that we've ever tried to knock on the door of the White House, um, knock and it shall be closed is my general <laughs> view, but I could be wrong, and uh, I, I hope I am wrong. Could I just come back on that yep, to stress more. that uh, I don't think we're saying that the British government's totally on board with all the ideas we have, sadly. It's, but we simply recognise an environment where there is a commonality of thinking yep. at government and in government circles. I wasn't suggesting any more than that. Good. No, I think it's well, a good way of putting I'm it. glad to hear it. Chris Batt. Chris Batt. I'm a PhD researcher at University College London looking at the role of knowledge as a public good. Um, the, th the thing that strikes me about what you said is very much looking at the construction of something, if you like, the supply side. And certainly in this country now, more and more when things are developed or <coughs> cases are made, people say, where's the public value? Demonstrate it to me. H have, you, have you thought how you're actually tangibly going to de demonstrate public value? Just, just to give you two examples, there's a, a sense to me that in a way, you're talking about additionality, doing something which adds extra value. I can see if we had something like this in the UK with public libraries closing in some places, it will be seen as a mechanism of substitution, or our mm. people would be arguing for that as a way of replacing something that disappears. 
and that may be more relevant as we move into a more digitized space in the future. So the, the question is the extent to which, in terms of rolling DPLA out, you're looking at finding ways of showing this is what can happen now which couldn't happen before. Well, it's, it's a very good question, and I certainly, as I think I tried to stress, would not want the DPLA to be thought of in any way as a substitute for public libraries. We have many leaders of the public of public libraries in on our steering committee. Uh, they are especially active in ways of developing, especially scope and content, which is one of the working groups that is helping to design this. So uh, we're very conscious of the importance of public libraries and we want to reinforce them. So that was that is what was behind my suggestion that we have a moving wall so that we don't try to provide the kinds of current bestsellers and pop novels and so on that are very much what public libraries mainly provide to their readers. Instead we will provide the kind of general basic background material. But this might be what you would say is um, added value or something uh, that is not truly innovative, if I've understood your, correction, your question correctly. We also are planning to develop all kinds of digitizing projects. These would involve uh, digitizing special collections that would be relevant to particular sectors of the public, uh, particularly ethnic groups. Uh, it's, uh, as you know, the U.S. is a country of immigrants, and each immigrant wants, uh, group wants uh, more access to their cultural heritage. I think of the Ukrainian collection at Harvard. We happen to have the largest Ukrainian collection in the world, including Ukraine. Uh, and there are a great many Ukrainians in the U.S., and they want to read their national literature. Well, um, you can't even do it in Ukraine, because Ukraine, as you know, was simply destroyed over and over again in the 20th century. So I want to digitize Harvard's Ukrainian collection, make it available to the Ukrainian people in Ukraine as well as in the U.S. That would be an example of an initiative. Another kind of initiative would be to go to small libraries scattered all over the country, which often have collections of local material of great interest to those people, not to necessarily to academics, but just to ordinary citizens. And we are imagining a, a kind of traveling Winnebago uh, outfit with a scanner in it that would go to uh, small towns and enlist them in the digitizing of their resources, uh, enable them to curate it and to make it available in special ways to local constituencies so that we, we would be reaching out in a way to the entire public. Uh, and there are indeed even other possibilities, but we're trying to think of all kinds of apps and um, developments that would make the DPLA not something that is simply a kind of storehouse of digital information, but a, 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 an organic, energetic entity that would be empowering communities in general. I, I don't know if that's an adequate answer to your question, but it's an important question. I've got at least five people wanting to uh, ask a question. Alistair Dunning, David Seitlin, Peter Burnhill, gentleman immediately behind Peter, and then gentleman immediately behind Margaret Coots. Alistair. Um, Alistair Dunning, Digitization Program Manager at JISC. Um, if all the content in the DPLA is going to be indexed by Google, presumably, What's going to stop people going to Google? Uh, well, no one would want to stop people from going to Google. I mean, I'm all for people going to Google or going anywhere else where they can get good service. So please don't interpret what I'm saying as an attack on Google. I think Google made a fundamental mistake when instead of going for fair use, they went for a commercial deal with the uh, publishers and authors who sued them for supposed infringement of copyright. Um, that, I think, was a mistake. But, of course, Google is a fabulous country, a, a company with... Uh, <laughs> uh, Freudian <it's>, slip. <laughs> you might think I feel it's a state with it is state. Well, but, uh, you mean it isn't? <laughs> have a visit to Mountain View, California, you might share that opinion. Indeed. Uh, 
But, you know, they have these wonderful computer scientists. They're very imaginative imaginative, and even for the world of libraries, you know, we have our rather traditional notions of cataloging. Along came Google and blew it out of the water and provided in some way, some ways, uh, excellent service. So I'm not at all um, attacking Google, uh, and Google would not do the indexing. You know, we are going to do the indexing, and we are going to have uh, open metadata. We're also working very hard on how that will be a, an asset that can be shared by everyone. But uh, if Google came to, came to us and said, we love your public-spirited idea and we wouldn't mind contributing to the public, might even do something for Google's reputation, uh, we'd say, great. I mean, I would love it if Google could make available not just its digital files, which are in Hathi Trust anyhow, but could make available its skill. So um, we will get it done, but we'll get it done without Google. And if Google wants to uh, reinforce us, so much the better. David? OK, thank you. Um, I'm David Zeitlin. I'm an academic from Oxford University. I'm also on the GIST Content Advisory Group. Um, I want to raise the thorny question of images and films where, of course, there's no fair use provision. Um, have you got any advice for how we can deal with copyright on there? Yeah. Well, the short answer is no. <laughs> I was hoping for advice from you, actually. <laughs> it certainly is true that we intend to have films, um, all kinds of material in all kinds of formats as part of the DPLA. Uh, that's the world that we live in now, in which images and sound recordings and so on are central not just to people's entertainment, which matters, but also to academic research. And we need to uh, have them preserved and made available. As you probably know, in the case of films, I mean, I think everyone would agree that film is a major art form. Half of all films produced before World War II have been lost, just gone. Uh, the problem of preservation of material in these formats is tremendous. And uh, as I'm sure you know, it's much more difficult and costly to preserve material in formats other than the written word. So we are mightily worried about this, and we haven't come up with a solution. Um, when it comes to pre preservation in general, uh, we, uh, so far, will probably use the techniques that are being developed everywhere, as we do at Harvard. At Harvard, we have a gigantic preservation facility. Uh, it's very expensive. We have electronic eyes that are looking at the ones and zeros that are uh, in the magnetic field of uh, digitized works and spot the unraveling of these ones and zeros, which happens at a distressing rate. Uh, and then we uh, instantly replace that text with another text, and we migrate it to different places, etc. Uh, you have to work very hard to preserve an ordinary digital text. To preserve uh, film and sound is a, is a very difficult thing. So in short, we uh, have not come up with an answer to that. We do intend to make this part of the DPLA. We are working so hard on all of these other problems that we uh, I, th I think I can say have more or less shelved the problem of material in other formats for future consideration. Uh, but we hope to do something about it. And if you've got suggestions, send them my way, please. Okay, uh, Peter Burnhill next. Yes, Peter. Uh, Peter Burnhill, uh, Adena, University of Edinburgh. Uh, very much uh, enjoyed the talk. Um, and I was reminded, actually, of... Uh, a, a meeting I had with Michael Buckland a long time ago, and I've been following his readings and, and, uh, since. And he talks about, for the digital library, the fusion between two traditions of the, the, the document tradition and the computational tradition. And it seems to me that there is a balance to be had here um, that uh, how you make this available for others to do computation upon. Um, 
So the, 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 there are apps is one of those fashionable things at the moment because, you know, there, there are tablets which have apps, et cetera, et cetera, and it's where they're manufactured, but also uh, the provision of APIs and, as you said, the, the availability for others to add values and, and do this in do things in unimaginable ways, I think is the phrase. Um, uh, but for that, it's a question of what it is that you will license people to be able to do as well as what you will technically enable them to do and whether you are at the moment favoring things like CC0 or whether you have any views on that. You didn't draw out that on the copyright. So partly on the technology to the API provision and partly, I think, on the licensing provision to allow people to do things. Yeah. Uh, that's a major policy decision which we are now facing, and uh, we are having a debate about it. So, again, I'm uh, eager to get advice from you. Um, among the uh, 40... Um, applications or uh, projects that were submitted in our beta sprint competition, uh, there were lots of suggestion for apps. And it's clear that there, as you put it, are unthought of possibilities in apps that could be part of the DPLA uh, so that we envisage a kind of, if you could call it that, general platform in which there will be many possibilities for apps development. Uh, I mean, that's just an abstract point of view. Um, but certainly, in the, in the, when I was trying to describe how we would hope to add value and not simply make available pre-existing sources, this is the main direction in, in which we intend to go. Uh, but as to the you know, policy about licensing and the rest, we haven't decided. So, for example, to what extent might we might this be commercial uh, with private partners and so on? Uh, not anything that would interrupt the open access to the basic holdings of the library, but for developing further services. Uh, I think it's quite possible that there will be such developments, and that that could be done with partnerships in the private sector. But we. You know, we haven't got there yet. Gentleman immediately behind Pete. I'm Geoffrey Darnton. I'm namesake. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we are related. Um, I'm not an academic, although I have spent time, I've done time as an academic. And I'm working really a small business, uh, working on meta modeling. But I have a particular interest in both participation um, and consultation. Uh, your comments were absolute music to my ears. I tear my hair out of the journal uh, issue and so on. Being able to get access, I can't. Um, but from the participation perspective, what I'm curious about is the initiative is fantastic. Have you got bottom-up participation? I mean, I was very pleased to hear you're not just targeting academics. You're, you're targeting everybody. Have you got the views of the everybody. In other words, the, the person who's not an academic, who's maybe small business, maybe not business, but who wants to walk into the little local public library and gain access to something for some reason. Um, because I think it's a fantastic vision, but uh, in all my own practice, I've always believed in combining top down with bottom up yep. to try and uh, see if somewhere in the middle we then end up with a fantastic project that everybody loves. Yes. Well, I couldn't agree more that um, our intention is to combine the two. Um, and the problem is how to combine bottom-up initiatives. Uh, it's one thing to have a website and ask the uh, little people scattered throughout the country to participate, and another to actually reach them and enlist them in this. Uh, so we do have a website. Uh, we put it up instantly, uh, and the response was in amazing. Uh, we have listservs. We've got discussion groups. Um, the, there is a national dimension to debates about what this ought to be. However, does your ordinary citizen in a small Midwestern town know about this? Certainly not. And so we are going to also have a campaign really to take our message to ordinary people. One way to do it is through the public libraries. 
So now we have a great many public librarians who are part of this and a crucial part of it. Um, but there are more things we could do. And I mentioned the sort of Winnebago attempt to reach into the interests of small towns by digitizing their uh, holdings. That's one sort of example. Uh, I'm not sure you know, what other policies we're going to do, but fundamentally, this will be a library for ordinary citizens. And I think, actually, there are a lot of ordinary citizens who want access to some of the esoteric material that is behind walls in our great research libraries. Um, you know, people, the, the, the U.S. is such a huge country, with, and people have so many different interests. Some people want specific information about butterflies or... Um, galaxies, uh, and they may want it for their own research, for s creating small businesses, for entertainment, I mean, uh, for writing a novel. It's, it's simply uh, amazing how much intelligence is scattered out there and never somehow comes together or never has access to uh, something that could activate it. So, yes, definitely uh, we are aiming at the ordinary citizen. And if we fail to provide that service for the ordinary citizen, we failed in what is our, our major goal. Just one quick remark about, you said small companies. All studies that I've consulted indicate that um, large companies have access to all the information they want. Small and medium-sized companies do not and that they, there is crucial information for them that they could make use of that is behind walls, inaccessible, uh, expensive, and even the, 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 the uh, elaborate problems of getting access to it through passwords and all kinds of uh, manipulation is, uh, in transformational time, difficult. So... I think open access is something that really will benefit small and medium-sized companies. And, you know, there's a whole bibliography of studies on this subject, some of it uh, written, articles written by economists in mathematical formulas that I can't understand. But uh, I think it's quite conclusive. So open access is good for small businesses. There's no question to it. Gentleman behind, Margaret. I'm John Levin. Uh without institution. You've spoken of uh, global internet access to the DPLA, and you've spoken of digitizing, for example, the Ukrainian collections in universities, um, in American universities. My question is, what is specifically American about the DPLA? What, is, what material would therefore be excluded by not being American? And at the, I'm also asking, what is national? A slightly different question, as opposed to international, about this library. Um, well, in our debate about the name for this thing, we considered National Digital Library. And many people objected because it had a slight ring of nationalism attached to it. Uh, so we rejected that. Uh, the word public is problematic in some ways, but leave that aside. What is American about it? Well, myself, having done my graduate work in Oxford and spent most of my research in France, in French archives, um, I believe in the Republic of Letters. I, the Republic of Letters is a republic conceived, so to speak, in the uh, late 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, as an intellectual realm without any police, without any boundaries, without any restrictions as to discipline, open to everyone, etc. Uh, the DPLA, in a way, will be the realization of the ideal of a republic of letters, which is international in character. What makes it American? Well, nothing in particular. It seems to me it could be uh, like Europeana, which is an amalgamation of many different sources. But there might be an American 
undertone to the thing, and that is why I invoke Jefferson. I mean, I really do believe in the Jefferson heritage. He was a flawed character in many ways, but he was a great man. And uh, I think the vision of a republic founded on a citizenry that was educated and could be educated thanks to the printing press and, edu and educational institutions of the sort that he f f favored and that Benjamin Franklin favored through the post office and uh, the um, first library, public library created by Franklin uh, and so on. Uh, all of this has somewhat of an American tincture to it along with the sense of private foundations committed to the public interest. Uh, that's the first place where we went, and I think maybe that was a kind of American reaction. Don't go to Washington, go to the Ford Foundation. And finally, I think there is uh, a kind of pragmatic can-do spirit to undertaking in America, where people uh, take risks and try to do something uh, on their own. So if that's an American characteristic, I think that the DPLA would represent something peculiarly American, but it's not honestly intended to be some kind of American message to the rest of the world. It's an attempt to create a service, first of all, for the American people, but one that will be so open-ended that it will be a service for everyone. And uh, after, you're trying to do the same thing. I mean, there are people in many parts of Europe who are also, there is an open access type of library in Mongolia. I mean, uh, this is a worldwide movement, and we are delighted to be part of it, but really there's no exclusive spirit behind it. Caroline. Bob, thank you very much. I have, I first of all, I have to start by saying to express my admiration for, I think, first of all, the vision, the real clarity of vision that you have, uh, and also for the energy and the drive with which you've been able to kind of pull, um, pull the organisation together. And I have to also confess a little bit of um, jealousy, which is never a nice quality. But uh, never maybe, expect that from the BL. But, but it will never, never, maybe spur us on in the UK to actually overcome some of the barriers that that, that we see to funding. Um, you know, the initial stages of this. We do have a very different culture, I think, here within, first of all, within the UK and also, I think, within the European context. But I think that the, I think the example that DPLA is kind of setting as a, a kind of just get up and get up and do something um, is, is, is a really important lesson for us. I think from, um, I think a lot of the, uh, from the British Library's perspective, um, I just to echo a couple of the points that other speakers have made. <laughs> First of all, one of our kind of strap lines has been that we um, were there for anybody who wants to do research. And I think that, that would, from our perspective, that must carry through to a lot of digital library initiatives. We, you, you're absolutely right. We have to think, uh, while the academic research will remain at the heart of a lot of our developments, particularly in the first phases, we have to think about who, you know, because where do those academic researchers go when they leave universities? They go into the third sector, they go into SMEs, they, and, and we, have to, we have to make sure that, um, you know, the digital content is there, um, you know, for everybody. I think we still have a huge amount to do to push on with our advocacy to try and look at copyright um, regulations, again, which are different within you know, the UK and Europe than they are within the US, but we still face a lot of the, the similar barriers. Um, I think the key point I would want to, to make, though, is that I think this forces... Um, this forces all institutions from even from from kind of huge research organizations like the british library um down to you know all 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 libraries and all information providers to rethink their own roles in this environment because you say there there are no barriers here we can do things differently and i think institutions need to, and within the british library we're doing this thinking what do we uniquely bring to the table what is it that we what what can we do best collectively what should we stop doing uh, and stop investing in in order that we can start investing in something that only we can do? And I think that, um, I, I, I think it's, to me, that's one of the conversations that we need to have as a community, yeah. um, nationally and internationally, because, um, you know, the, we, 
funding of all of this will be so precious, as you've pointed out, that um, we've really got to maximise the benefit we get from any available funding. And, you know, duplicating effort and not working collaboratively on this, I think, would be a major sin going forward. Um, is there anything, have you thought about the kind of the, the role that individual institutions will play in DPLA? Mm -hmm. have, you, have, you, have you given that much thought yet? Uh, thank well, you. We, thank you. Um, as a, someone who spent many, many months in the uh, British Library when it was the British Museum, it's wonderful to hear uh, from you and to know that you, you know, share with the gen these general principles. And of course, the, the British Library has fabulous collections that no one else has. So there is a role, I think, for any library that has something unique uh, to contribute to, to make it available to, to the rest of the world. Uh, the British Library is at the very top of that sort of um, uh, pyramid of institutions, but it's not really a pyramid. You've just got scattered collections all over, and they don't talk to one another. Now, as you know, we have in the US um, independent research libraries. That's just one other example, such as the Huntington and the Newbury and the Morgan. They're great, great libraries, and they have fabulous collections. So we want to make room for them in the DPLA. And I think, in a way, their contribution would be similar to that of the British Library, although you're much greater than, than all of them combined. Uh, so we want to reach out to these research libraries, which actually have, uh, although they're very open-minded, they have been behind closed doors. Not that they won't admit researchers, but most people have never heard of the Newbury Library, which is a, 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 a simply a great, great library. So I'm hoping that the, the Folger and the John Carter Brown and the Newbury, the Huntington, etc., will all be part of this. And when you think of the value of their collections, many of which have been digitized, not fully, but to a considerable extent, it's a matter of integrating them into this distributed network. So that, that's very much what we're attempting to do, and I, the response from them has been very encouraging. So I'm glad that the British Library would be sympathetic to this sort of undertaking. Right, I've got... Paul, and then gentlemen at the back on my left as I'm looking out, and then Graham Taylor. Um, thank you. I, I too found this um, quite inspiring, actually. I have a question which is quite similar to the bottom-up question earlier, um, so I'll try and focus it a little. I think everything you've described so far I would um, characterise as um, involving professional curation, whether it's uh, the, the big libraries or the small research libraries that are getting involved. Um, I was struck by the, the um, travelling Winnebago, um, the kind of the magic bus of the counterculture almost. I think. Um, and clearly that won't scale, but it's an interesting um, approach too to going out and engaging people. And I, I sense that that's also operating at a semi-professional level it's engaging with professional curators of one sort or another so my question really is about um, what's the role for the amateur um, the researcher who um, for example has the wherewithal nowadays to digitize a, a very small collection of um, of pamphlets or, or some such and possibly the ability to upload these into some collection somewhere um, and a sort of related question to this is I, I noted at the very beginning you were talking about um, not establishing a large database behind the, of, uh, you know, that's sort of owned by the DPLA, but to aggregate the, the available databases. But where does the stuff that's digitised by the magic bus or, or maybe in the future by the amateur go? Um, is there actually going to be a, a place to catch the things which are not already in a collection but nonetheless have been offered for free and are unencumbered by the problems of copyright and so forth? Right. Um, well, the material that will be developed in the uh, Winnebago scanner operation, which is not just a fantasy. Actually, we're going to do a pilot project and uh, see how it works. It will go in a, in a database that we will set up. Now, we could simply channel it toward Hathi Trust, which is very good at preserving material, uh, but Hathi Trust so far 
preserves material, it doesn't make material accessible. So it's quite possible that we will have our own database. I simply said, don't imagine you know, one single Google-like database, whether it's clouds or not, in order to uh, avoid the misconception that we are building some uh, physical, huge enterprise. We may do so in the long run. But um, of course, if you're going to reach out to amateurs and help them, this is professional help, but help them do what they want to do and make the most of their resources, that has to be kept somewhere. So yes, I do think we will have a central database of some sort, or maybe several databases scattered around. And we, you know, I hope we will have staffs of curators who can help local people develop a collection around a core uh, body of digitized works, but then it could grow and grow and grow. I mean, when people start going to their attics and coming down with letters from the First World War, the Civil War, whatever, uh, think, of, think of what it could be. I mean, our attics are crammed with material that no one knows about. And I think this kind of attic resource is something that should be uh, put to use in local constituencies, but made available uh, through interoperable um, transmission to, to everyone. So yes, we definitely think of it's back to this grassroots idea I mean, we're de and bottom-up idea. We're definitely trying to develop that. We have to get up and running first, but this is a central ingredient of our planning from the very start. Yeah, yeah. Gentleman at the back. Hello. Uh, my name is Simon Barrow, and I work with electronic resources at Durham University Library. Um, somebody tweeted earlier that there'd inevitably be a question about the Stop Online Piracy Act, so this is it. Uh, basically, what impact do you think, if not this legislation, but this kind of restrictive legislation could have on expansive digital projects like the DPLA? Um, well, actually, there are two threats, each of which is very serious. One is the so-called uh, Online Piracy uh, Proposal Act, and the one I was referring to is a different one, and that is an attempt to reverse the NIH mandate for making accessible NIH-sponsored research to the public. Uh, I think both are serious threats, and I hope we can head off both of them including the one that you, that you mentioned. Behind this is a principle that public financed research should be available free of charge to the public. After all, the taxpayers have already paid for it. Shouldn't they be able to read the results of their taxpayer dollars? Uh, that argument, it seems to me, is unanswerable. Now, if a private publisher says, we add so much value to it that we should have the exclusive right to it, I simply don't get the argument. I don't deny that they add value, but they add so much cost that it's, it, as in a way, counterproductive. It's becoming the monopoly of the few who have access to that commercially controlled knowledge. So um, if the attempt to reverse the NIH policy succeeds, we are in a very bad place. Uh, and there was another bill called, you may have heard of it, FERPA, F-R-P-A-A. -A. Um, that is a bill to broaden what began as an NIH policy so that all research that is funded by federal dollars should be made available free of charge to the public. It seems to me that that's also, uh, it's, there's an unanswerable argument about the public's right to publicly financed research. Uh, and uh, I haven't studied the actual text of the bill about so-called pri piracy, but um, we have an office at the Harvard Library full of people who follow this very closely, and they all uh, assure me that this is not really so much about piracy, but more about censorship and limiting the internet. So uh, we are supporting the attempts to stop that bill as well. Now, will these bills making their way through Congress succeed? It's hard to know in an election year, but I'm amazed at the capacity of lobbies to develop 
fresh bills to try to take away ground that we have conquered for the public interest. Uh, so I think eternal vigilance is demanded. <laughs> Timely to ask, perhaps, uh, to ask Graham Taylor to ask a question. Um, here we go. My name's Graham Taylor. I'm from the Publishers Association in the UK. I suspect I'm the only publisher in the room. Any others? Hands up. Okay. No. I'm the only one. Um, uh, Professor Danton, I've enjoyed very much listening to you, and um, you might be surprised to hear much of which, personally at least, I agree with, and I find really quite inspirational. Um, I've sat here for about an hour and a half, and um, I haven't heard a single good word said about publishers or publishing by anybody. It's been entirely negative. Um, in fact, you seem to wish that Google had used its huge, and if anybody's a monopoly, boy, are they a monopoly, and use its huge monopolistic power to push on and prove that fair use includes digitizing other people's stuff without bothering to ask them and making it available as they choose, um, commercially if needs be, and so on. So I think my question is quite a... I'd like to make it a tough one, if I can, which is... Um, how on earth do publishers fit into all these visions that I've been hearing this afternoon? Because I would argue that a role of the publisher that often gets forgotten is that actually we're the, we're the risk takers, we're the people who invest in intellectual property and take it to the market. Now, you can say, well, okay, you have huge bestsellers and you make a lot of money, but those 800 books that got published on the 1st of October, I bet you no more than 50 of them will make any money for the author and the publisher. I may be wrong. I think without publishers, you're in danger of not having any books, and then you won't have any libraries, and then you won't have your grand vision. So where do we fit into all this? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Actually, uh you might be surprised uh, about how much I agree with what you've said. Uh, I, I love publishers. I've, I've been on the board of the Oxford University Press for 15 years. Um, I'm on the board of the Harvard University Press. These are university presses, but they have to balance budgets. And I followed the struggle of publishers uh, to survive in a tough economic climate very carefully. Uh, and, in fact, a lot of my own research is in the history of publishing. So uh, my uh, heart is definitely with the publishers and also with booksellers. I think booksellers are even more threatened than publishers. Yeah. Publishers really do uh, add, not only do you add value, but you add value in a way that cannot be done by anyone else, I think. So uh, I uh, would not want anything I've said to be construed as anti-publisher. What I'm attacking is excessive monopolistic commercial practices on the part of some publishers who have driven up uh, the prices of academic journals to such an extent that they're damaging the world of knowledge. And that's a separate subset. Um, I think your point about risk-taking really is on target. No need for me to tell this to you because uh, you take risks all the time. But it's very striking to anyone who's followed uh, reports from the marketplace about sales that publishing is a very risky business. And uh, the way the risks are dealt with is sometimes, I would think, unfortunate in that the so-called Overinvestment in the attempt to have a blockbuster bestseller is made at the expense of, of quality and building up a, a, a sound backlist. Um, I think less so in Britain. Probably your publishing industry in many ways is superior to that in the U.S., where the, the um, buying up of publishing houses, the, the large fish eating the smaller fish and in turn getting eaten by still larger fish, some of whom turn out to be German in many cases, uh, that is an unfortunate trend. And you have only to read the, the, the writings of people like Andre Schifrin and others who are constantly bewailing the over-commercialization of publishing in the U.S., but without ever 
minimizing the importance of making a profit and balancing the books. So what can be done about this risk taking? Now here, here's where I would offer some, if you like, irresponsible radical suggestions just for you to consider. Um, and I, they, I offer them tentatively. On January 30th, so in just a few days, um, uh, we are sponsoring at Harvard a conference on possibilities of business plans in publishing that would make sustainable attempts at open access. How could this be done? Well, you probably uh, know about Frances Pinter and some of her suggestions, and there are other similar suggestions. The basic idea being for libraries to get together and to guarantee to publishers to buy, guarantee in advance, to buy enough copies of worthy books to cover costs and leave you with a decent profit. If we can do that on a large enough scale, we can eliminate the factor of risk, at least for some of books, and provide a real service to you while you are doing what you do best, namely acting as a gatekeeper of quality. Uh, I don't mean just sheer academic quality. I mean quality that could interest ordinary readers as well as college professors. I, I think that that kind of an argument of trying to use open access for the benefit of publishers is an important one, and it takes many forms. Another one is just digital publishing in general, which uh, this is debatable, but I think most information suggests that often digitized editions can reinforce the sale of printed editions. And aside from that, they can do things that printed editions can't do uh, by all kinds of hyperlinks and extra sources. I, I, I just did a book on with the Harvard University Press. It's a normal published book, but it has an electronic supplement, and it's about street songs in Paris in the mid-18th century turns out that street songs were, uh, they, they were in effect newspapers in a, in a, at a time when there were no real newspapers with news in them. News gets transmitted by song. Everyone improvises new words to old tunes every day, and these spread like wildfire through Paris, and many of them are very funny and very seditious. Well, after uh, sp having spent months and months doing research about the text of these, I wondered how they s sounded and I was able to find the original music, a musical annotation, and to get a friend of mine who's a cabaret performer in Paris to sing them, and they are available uh, free online. So the reader buys the book and then has an appendix with the texts of the songs in French and in English translation, and then can hear them. So it's as if you're hearing the past. I think the electronic publishing opens up wonderful new possibilities and that really creative publishers can make the most of those possibilities to adapt themselves to the digital environment. So I really do not mean to be deprecating publishers in uh, opposing the over-commercialization and monopolistic practices of some of them. Thank you. Sadly, I think we're just about out of time, so I can't really take more questions. I would like to thank, on your behalf, uh, Professor Danton, for a, a wonderful, uh, inspirational lecture, uh, and also for a very fascinating and exciting and energising debate. I think uh, once it's up there, it's going to be as much of a hit as the 2009 uh, Libraries of the Future discussion, so very many thanks. There's no way I can aim to su sum up uh, what's happened over the last couple of hours. Other than I think to say that it's clear to me that there are so many core themes that we share in terms of UK, US, uh, with particular emphasis on uh, parallel and complementary initiatives, not least in terms, of, uh, in terms of our side of the Atlantic, the Resource Discovery Programme, um, and, and certainly a lot to take forward in terms of futures, whether it's JISC or SCONL or RL UK, and certainly... Uh, very much motivated to take things forward in collaboration. And I, I'm, I was very struck by something that Caroline Brazier said in, in finishing. We need to determine what it is, what, the th what are the things that only we can do. But that collective we is a very powerful force. 
and I think it's actually going to be a very exciting future. So thank you very much, Robert.